far we have been looking at additive and abelian categories and we looked at some of the properties of abelian categories. Yeah. Today we would like to study a class of abelian categories which is uh, larger, uh, sorry I mean which has more properties but it is a smaller class. Okay, and before we begin with that, I mean, see, our plan for the next couple of lectures is going to be uh, identifying where abelian categories live. I mean, we will show in particular that all small abelian categories can be treated concretely. And uh, <laughs> later on, we will show, we will talk about a particular very strong class of uh, abelian categories. They will be co-complete. Yeah, so, it is a large class which contains all module categories and something related to that and later on we will uh, like in the next lecture we will try to see some homological algebra. Yeah, we will uh, start with the notion of an exact sequence today, but we will continue in that direction in the next lecture. So, that is our plan, fine. So, uh, let us look at this simple definition. Say that a sequence 0 to A to B to C to 0 of objects of A of objects and morphisms of an abelian category A a sequence 0 to A to B to C to 0, let me call these F and G of objects and morphisms of an abelian category A is said to be <coughs> an exact sequence if, first of all I mean do you understand what this 0 is, yeah, it is the 0 object and 0 to A is the unique map which is again the uh, 0 of that home set and C to 0 is also the unique map which is the 0 of that home set, okay. So, this is said to be an exact sequence if f is a monomorphism, then g is an epi and third one that kernel of g is isomorphic to image of f. Okay, so Normally, if you have seen this definition of an exact sequence somewhere else, then you will say kernel of G is equal to, but here we are treating kernel and image as morphisms. So, in the sub object poset of, uh, of that object, middle object B, these two are isomorphic. Okay, so, uh, F is a mono. Now, let us verify that actually at every internal object in this sequence, we are asking for exactly the same condition. What is the image of this 0 morphism from 0 to A? It is 0 and then F is a mono which means kernel of F is also 0. Yeah. Similarly, at C, look at the image of G. What is image of G? because G is an epi, so it is C and uh, what is the kernel of the next morphism C to 0? Whole of C. So, therefore, the I mean the identity on C, yeah, in both cases it is the identity of C. So, again that is isomorphic. So, at every internal node A, B and C, we have got the property that kernel of the next morphism is isomorphic to the image of the previous morphism. Obviously, we cannot check it at 0 objects. Yeah. Later on in the next lecture, we will see the notion of a chain complex and an exact sequence, long exact sequence, there where we will extend this on both sides to infinity. Sir, what 
Image is what we define. It's the kernel of the co-kernel. Image of G will be G, uh, yeah, isomorphic, yeah, isom like identity map on C. It will be isomorphic to the identity map on C. Uh, okay, but the kernel of zero map is not. Kernel of zero map will also be identity on C. Everything goes to, yeah, right. So, this is an exact sequence if these three properties or equivalently it is exact at each point at A, at B and at C. Okay, that is what like we can also define the exactness locally. Okay, uh, then I mean some simple observations which you uh, yeah, some remarks. So, 0 to A to B is exact if and only if f is mono. Okay, the dual remark would be that b to c to 0, this g is exact if and only if g is epic. I mean that is what I have written above. And uh, yes, one more property that you might uh, find interesting is that this identity map followed by some morphism is exact if and only if f is no, f is 0, f is the 0 morphism because what is the image of A? image of identity is identity morphism itself and therefore it has to be the kernel of the next object right so kernel of the next object is so kernel has to be everything so therefore f is 0 and do you remember uh, what we said okay we will uh, we'll use this particular remark in the next uh, proof so before that let me give you the definition of an exact functor. So, a functor f from a to b for a and b abelian is an exact functor, is said to be an exact functor. if it takes short exact sequences to short exact sequences, if it preserves exact sequences. So, notice something, so far we have talked about additive functors between pre-additive categories. Here we are not at all referring to the home sets we are not asking that additive means that 0 should go to 0, then byproduct should be preserved. Nothing of that sort we are asking for, but that is all automatic. Yeah. So, uh, let us see that. So, uh, first, I mean uh, thanks to remark 3 above. What do we conclude? That f is the zero morphism if and only if the identity morphism is exact. And do you remember some some party, uh, some uh, result that we proved last time? When is an object the zero object? Let me scroll up. Home set, Home set is singleton and uh, we wrote something. Yes, I think uh, it is here. Yes. So, for an 
for a pre-additive category, an object is initial if and only if it is terminal, if and only if the identity is 0. Okay, so <laughs> now use this, yes. It should take exact sequences to exact sequences. No, I am not assuming additivity. Yes. So, see any functor will always preserve equations and therefore, what does it preserve? I mean look at these two results that we proved last time. That some object is 0, some object is the 0 object in a pre-additive category if and only if its identity is 0. And identity 0 is equality, it is an equation. So, that equation must be preserved. Okay, so, therefore, what will happen? That in the image also the same thing will, will be true. Identity is always preserved, right? By any functor. So, thanks to this and remark 3, we can conclude that 0 objects are preserved. Yes, remark 3 said that you can fill up the details, yeah, it is not hard. So, identity is always preserved, so therefore, zero morphi morphism is also like this, this is the only morphism, yeah, so that is preserved, so therefore, zero objects are preserved and uh, I mean first zero morphism is preserved and hence zero object is also preserved thanks to this, this particular result, okay, later on look at what we said. The next result was that for any two objects, the uh, product exists if and only if it is the co-product and if and only if the third condition and third condition has nothing to do with categorical properties. Yeah, it only talks about equations and equations are always preserved. So, therefore, F also preserves, if it preserves exact sequences, then this is like an exact sequence. Yeah, you take nu 1, then pi 2, that is an exact sequence. 0, nu 1, pi 2, 0, that is an exact sequence and similarly 0, nu 2, pi 1, 0 is also an exact sequence. And then you have these identities, so everything will be preserved, all the identities will be preserved by an exact function. So, therefore, Byproducts will also be preserved. So, uh, let me just write this now. Thanks to remark 3, uh, f an exact functor preserves zero morphisms and Hence, zero objects. Okay. So, similarly, I mean, I can uh, even if you assume one side. So, therefore, I mean, what, what do we really need here? Therefore, F is exact if and only if f preserves kernels and co-kernels. Yeah, zero object, zero morphism, everything is preserved. So, what remains is only kernel and co-kernel. So, an exact functor is only this. Actually, uh, this is a definition now that say that f is left exact if it preserves kernels. I mean uh, sorry, I mean uh, if it takes an exact sequence. 0 to A to B to C to 0, 
to an exact sequence 0 to f a to f b to f c. We do not ask for the last 0 that is left exact. So, left exact always preserves kernels and right exact preserve co kernels. So, it is like one half of the definition. A functor is exact if it preserves, if it is both lex and rex. Yeah, so, uh, left exact is usually abbreviated as lex. So, <clears throat> I mean even one half of it is sufficient. Yes. If it preserves short exact sequences, then yes. So, to preserve split exact split exactness, yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. So by uh, Split monos and split epis, they are they are always preserved. They are absolute limits and co-limits. Yeah, so therefore they are always preserved. So let me just write that. So recall that absolute limit and co-limits are the limits and co-limits which are preserved by any functor. You don't need to ask for them. We have seen many such examples. Yeah, the splitting of an idempotent then split mono, split epi and split co-equalizers in Beck's monadicity theorem. Yes, we, we did cover that. We did not cover the proof, but we did cover the, uh, the statement. Yeah, G split co-equalizers. Okay. So, split monos, mono and epi are always preserved and hence uh, the exact sequences of the type. I mean, I am just reminding you of what this is, the byproduct sequence, yeah, A direct sum B. And then to b, this is mu 1, this is pi 2 to 0 and then in the reverse direction we have mu 2 and in the reverse direction we have pi 1, okay. So, are preserved by any uh, lex functor, lex or rex functor. Okay, so therefore, what can we say? See, Lex functor is will preserve kernels that we have seen, and Lex functor also preserves byproducts. So, in particular, it preserves binary products. So, Lex therefore, Lex is Lex implies Cartesian, and Rex implies co-Cartesian. Yeah, finite limit preserving. I mean, this is a regular category, okay, regular category, uh, abelian categories are regular, which means kernel pairs of morphisms exist. Kernel pairs means you take a morphism F and with the same codomain, you take another copy of F over here and then you take the pullback. So, pullback of f along itself that is the kernel pair and the co-equalizers of kernel pairs exist over here and the definition is self-dual, definition of abelian categories is self-dual. So, therefore, uh, lex is precisely regular, I mean exact is precisely regular, but then it automatically gives you the other half because it is self-dual definition. Okay, so, therefore, what do we have that exact sequences are additive 
even left left exact sequence uh, sorry functors are also additive exact functors are additive left exact functors are also additive right exact functors are additive but lex and rex are both something more they preserve kernels and co-kernels respectively so uh, an exact functor is a bicartesian functor it preserves finite limits as well as finite co-limits okay good then uh, let us look at one particular type yeah this is the strongest possible type of categories that you can uh, ask for strongest as in the sense that you want all the nice properties of the category of abelian groups to be present in such categories okay so uh, what are such categories called well these categories are called grothendieck categories grothendieck abelian categories is also another name so grothendieck defined them obviously as the name suggests he he did not call it grothendieck abelian categories so he gave a list of axioms ab1 ab1 op or ab1 star the dual condition then ab2 ab2 star and so on up to ab5 ab5 did not have a dual con i think uh, yeah ab5 also had a dual condition the ab1 ab2 ab3 and their duals they together give you the definition of an abelian category yeah so these are known as grothendieck's axiom and uh, ab4 and ab5 are what we are going to write down and then there is one extra property which is always nice to have okay so uh, let us define grothendieck categories so once again i want to remind you that the purpose of defining grothendieck categories is we want all the nice properties of the category of abelian groups to be present in this category what do you know so far about the category of abelian groups abelian okay so grothendieck category let me say that yeah the first one is that <laughs> yes and very smart uh, answer that grothendieck abelian categories are abelian categories uh, an abelian category a is a grothendieck category if okay what about uh, the category of abelian groups does it have some infinite limits or co-limits it has all infinite limits and all infinite co-limits in particular it is com yeah it is complete and co complete but in particular it has got all co products okay so the first condition that i am going to write down is that it has all small co products well when we assume that it is an abelian category we already know it has got all finite limits as well as co limits in particular we have got all coequalizers because coequalizers are same as co-kernels so therefore i mean equivalently it is co-complete because all co-limits can be constructed out of arbitrary co-products and finite i mean binary coequalizers okay second property now this has to do with one lecture in the middle that we talked about the commutations of limits and co-limits what was the special property of the category of sets filtered okay filtered what filtered co-limits uh huh a co-limit of a filtered shape commutes with limits of any finite shape 
सो फाइनाइट लिमिट कम्यूट विथ फिल्टर्ड को लिमिट ओके नाउ लुक एट एन अ शॉर्ट एग्जैक्ट सीक्वेंस शॉर्ट एग्जैक्ट सीक्वेंस हैज वॉट इट हैज गॉट अ कर्नल एंड अ को कर्नल मोनो एंड एपी एंड ओके सो कर्नल एंड को कर्नल Co-kernels are obviously going to be preserved by short by directed co-limits, filtered or equivalently directed. Yeah, we have seen that result. And actually, I mean, yeah, I should remind you that we have also seen that the same property that filtered co-limits or directed co-limits commute with finite limits, it also holds in any category of finitary algebras. So, in particular. it holds in the category of abelian groups abelian groups are finitary algebras it's just one binary operation one unary operation and so therefore this property holds true in the category of abelian groups we have to include it in the list but we are not going to write that all directed colimits commute with finite limits we are going to write that a directed colimit of short exact sequences i mean short exact sequence or exact sequences that we wrote it's also called short exact sequence is again short exact okay so now I'll look here yeah so we are taking a sequence so let's say natural numbers is our shape for zero we have a short exact sequence A zero, B zero, C zero. Then A one, B one, C one, and then we have A n, B n, C n. That's the short exact sequence. Then if I take vertically, if I take the directed colimit of A n, vertically directed colimit of B n and directed colimit of C n. Then obviously the last part because it's an epimorphism. Epimorphisms have to do with pushouts or in this case co kernels. Directed colimits and Pushouts or co-equalizers, they obviously commute because both are co-limits. So therefore, there will be a last zero, but there may not be the first zero. In general, right? The first zero has to come from a kernel. So the sequence of kernels is again taken to a sequence of kernels, which means. see uh, we never had to ask for finite products because finite products and finite coproducts commute i mean sorry they coincide in the case of an abelian category so therefore directed colimits automatically commute with finite products so it only remains to ask that do directed colimits commute with kernel kernels and that is what this property is saying that it preserves kernels as well it commutes with kernels that's the only remaining thing okay so this is ab4 and ab5 uh, okay then uh, these these two properties do not have duals and the third one that uh, it has a generator okay so what is the meaning of generator generator means it's a separator or equivalently it is a, a detector a single object which is both separator or detector so how do we uh, do it let us recall it quickly what is the meaning of a generator it can distinguish between two dis uh, parallel morphisms so generator so let us say g so let me remind you of the definition that g is a generator or separator that is what i am defining if for any two uh for any parallel morphism with f not equal to g we have we have a morphism h from g to a such that fh is not equal to gh well re rephrase it ie 
f minus g composed with h is not equal to 0. Well, what do we mean? Like ie in this case, it will turn out that the home g a is non-zero non for any a. Okay, so this is a transform definition of a generator or a separator in an uh, in a pre-additive category. Yeah, the home set has to be non-zero. There should always exist a non-zero morphism. So, for example, in the category of abelian groups, what is the generator? Z. Yeah, I mean for any a non-zero, obviously. Yeah. I, In abelian categories, yes, yeah, because we are just uh, talking about abelian setting here. And dually, a cogenerator would be something such that the other home set is non-zero. Home A blank C would be non-zero. Okay, so uh, I mean, let me remind you if you remember the detect definition of a detector. A detector was that if you have a mono which is not an iso. Then there is a morphism from G to the target of that mono, which does not factor through this mono. Now, uh, if your category is balanced, then generate uh, separator is a detector. And if your category has equalizers, then detector is separator. So, last time we saw that every abelian category is balanced. And obviously, it has equalizers because it has <coughs> kernels. So therefore, detector and separator, there is no real difference. This is the definition of a generator. Yeah, that is what you have to use. So a growth authentic category, if it has three properties. See, what is the main point of number three here? It has a generator, which means like uh, every single abelian group can be written as a quotient of a huge direct sum of copies of z. So, same thing here also I can write down. Yeah, so, uh, this implies I am writing it in bracket that for any x in object of A, there exists a set i and a short exact sequence g i to 0 uh, to x to 0. Okay, what is g to the power i? It is the co-product of capital I many copies of g. Yeah. So, there is a an epimorphism from g to the power i to x. Okay, so this generator actually makes it so that the category is large, but it is not too large. You remember this statement? When did we use this? That it is large, but not too large. In what context did we use this? No, no, not special adjoint functor theorem. Class of sets, no. We do not want to talk about set theory here. GFT, what is GFT? Adjoint functor theorem, no. No, it is large but not too large. We said this for locally presentable categories. Locally pre presentable categories have got finitely presentable objects forming a set and then every object of that category is a directed co-limit of finitely presentable objects. Okay, so that time we said this. So this third condition ensures that our category is not too large. The first one says that it is co-complete and the second one says it has this desired property that finite limits commute with filtered co-limits. Yeah, so all these properties. So what will be examples? Yes, 
abelian groups category of abelian groups what is the generator generator is z and how do we cover any abelian group how do we cover every abelian group like as an epimorphism we simply take z to the power bracket x yeah and then send everything to uh, every uh, unit vector with only one non zero entry to itself yeah generator is z then obviously we have seen the i mean without proof we have seen that directed colimits and finite limits commute and it it obviously has all coproducts this is a monadic category over this so everything is created and for free okay so uh, another example is the category of r modules for any ring r what is the generator r yeah r is one of the generators i mean of course if there is one generator doesn't mean there can't exist others yeah but is a generator maybe i shouldn't write equal to but is a generator okay uh, r modules also have the same properties this is also nice then some uh, properties for those who know about these things that sheaves of an uh, sheaves of abelian groups on a topological space power of a generator is also co power i would say not power co power means co product of some index family so sheaves of abelian group on a topological space or sheaves of abelian group uh on a site on a grothendieck site ah uh? commutative rings i never said anything about commutative rings no why, why are you asking that uh, a single commutative ring category of commutative rings no category of commutative rings that's not even balanced yeah so if it is not balanced it can't be abelian yeah so the obviously it's out of question okay so sheaves of abelian groups uh, you probably don't know some of you may know so these are examples of this and grothendieck site is something i will probably explain in the last week are there any other examples for which abelian categories any abelian category okay that's a very good question so i am giving you two different classes perhaps but perhaps you don't appreciate them yeah this sheaves of abelian groups are on yeah i mean what i think are modules and sheaves of yes and yes so then uh, i will give you more examples that's a good question then quasi coherent sheaves on a scheme yeah this is also an example of this see right now you are asking me for an example of a grothendieck category and grothendieck categories have to be very special yeah so they have to have lot of properties and that's actually our next goal and uh, let me write this any localization any localization of a grothendieck category with exact uh with exact localization functor is also grothendieck so i am trying to give you 
some <laughs> way of closing it under more uh, of creating more growth endic categories. But of course, I haven't defined what is meaning of localization. So that's going to be our next topic. Hmm? So let me state what. Uh, so localization, those who have studied algebra, commutative algebra, let's say, uh, they should be familiar with the concept. So uh, consider Z. Hmm? Then in, in integers, you take consider all non-zero integers. Is the set of non-zero integers closed under multiplication? Uh, does it contain 1? Yes. And what if you want to invert all these non-zero integers? Like multiplicatively invert all the non-zero integers, what do you get? Rational numbers. Okay, so basically this is called localization. Localization means you want to make something, some elements invertible. Some elements in that ring should become units. But, well, this is a category theory course, not an algebra course. So, an element does not really make sense. We have to replace an element by an arrow. Yeah, and some collection of arrows should become invertible under a functor. And it should be the smallest such thing. So, for example, when you talk about integers and localizing or inverting all the non-zero integers, then you can also construct real numbers. Real numbers also have the same property, but the smallest such thing is rational numbers. So, whenever there is a ring homomorphism from Z to any other ring such that all non-zero integers uh, have their images units, then there must exist a unique morphism from rational numbers to that given ring. So, in this sense, this rational numbers is the universal such construction together with an embedding from integers to rational numbers. Okay, I said lots of things without writing anything, but this is the idea from algebra. Now, a ring is a pre small a single object preadditive category. So, therefore, now we want to invert everything possible like uh, all the some collection of arrows that we want to invert. Okay. So, let me uh, give you some, some different ways of doing this. Localization in categories. Okay. So, uh, let S be a class of morphisms in a category C. Yeah, here I am writing just usual Roman S. Let S be a class of morphisms in a category C. Localization of C with respect to S is the universal functor <coughs> C to S inverse C such that I will call it L yeah, because I want to call it localization such that given I mean sorry uh, uh, let me write this such that first of all if S if F is a morphism in S, then L of F is an ISO. Yeah, so, for all F in S, 
L of f is an isomorphism and whenever, so for any functor f from c to d that takes every morphism f in S to an isomorphism there is a unique f tilde from S inverse C to D such that the following diagram commutes. Obviously, this is L, this is F and this is D and this is S inverse C and there exists a unique F tilde such that this diagram commutes. So, what did we start with? We started with a collection of morphisms which we want to invert. Now, let us look at one particular example then you will understand that there are ramifications of this, yeah, it is not automatic. So, for example, so uh, let us consider this, let R be a ring and S be the class of morphisms in R mod yeah, that uh, consisting of this. So, any any module you take multiplication by 2 map for any module MR. Left module I am denoting by writing R as a subscript. So, x mapping to 2x, this map you would like to invert. Then what will happen to the map that is x mapping to 4x? If x mapping to 2x is always inverted, then x mapping to 4x which is a composition of two such maps, then that will also be inverted. So, in fact, all powers of 2 will be inverted. Yes, so, uh, so automatically so 2 to the n dot blank will also be inverted. then there is also another ramification right i mean here i am talking about 2 as 1 plus 1 but what happens to the map multiplication by 6 well multiplication by 6 is same as now is isomorphic to multiplication by 3 you can always invert like that effect is nullified now so multiplication by 6 and multiplication by 3 will be similar so, if there is something which has let us say order 2, then it will get killed. I mean uh, up to isomorphism, so you have uh, multiplication by 6 map and multiplication by 3 map and then there is a multiplication by 2 map in between. You, you just write a commutative triangle, then this map is invertible, multiplication by 2 map is invertible, so therefore their codomains. Yeah, I mean th that becomes an e e uh, equivalence, not necessarily equality, but it becomes equivalence. So, uh, this is what like there are consequences of inverting some morphisms. So, in particular, if F and G are two morphisms in S, then their composition even though, uh, composition if it exists. The, even though it may not be present in S, it will also become invertible. 
So composition of two invertible maps must become invertible. Then obviously any invertible map will remain invertible under any such thing. So you would like to add these properties. Understood? That you would like to say that the class of morphisms with respect to which we are localizing, that's actually a subcategory. And it should contain all the identity morphisms. Because they are automatically going to be inverted. And this is the same thing that we talked about when we considered Z and non-zero integers. Yeah, that this set is closed under multiplication. Multiplication is composition. So this is a subcategory and it contains one. It contains identity. Right? So you can invert, uh, like it's more logical to invert at subcategories which contain all the identities. And also the invertibles, well, we are not going to say anything about that. They will always remain invertible, but we don't have to specify. So just for the sake of talking about it, yeah, we will uh, do this. Okay. Now uh, look at this. This I'm going to use a slightly different notation over here. Uh, so for example, eh, sorry, no, I'm not using any different look, uh, notation. But suppose uh, elements of S will be, it, it could be a set or it could be a class, will be denoted, uh, are denoted by zigzag arrows. Okay, so this curly arrows. So suppose I have this, I have three objects like this, then this particular map A to B is invertible in the target. And I have one more such pair of morphisms. Then what will be the composition of such things? Like this, uh, then in the localized category, this B to C via going invert, inverse along, let me call this F1 and G1, F2 and G2. And I already said that this wiggly arrow is in S. So this particular map G1 composed with F1 inverse, this particular composition is a morphism in the resulting category <coughs> because F, F1 will be invertible, right? So G1, F1 inverse is a new arrow <coughs> in the resulting category. So we are trying to describe what happens in S inverse S, uh, S inverse C. So this part will be invertible. Then similarly, we should be allowing compositions of such things. Yeah, two such things. Well, finitely many such things because if it's a category, we have to close it under compositions. So in general, imagine what happens. I'm given two fixed objects and then in between I can take finite zigzags of this kind. One inverse then direct, inverse direct, inverse direct. I can take finite zigzags. So imagine how many morphisms there will be. Even if we start with a locally small category, in between, like uh, we are allowed to choose any arbitrary C and C could be coming from a proper class. It could be a very large collection. So uh, therefore, like all things, all finite sequences of objects and finite sequences of these morphisms, that collection could be large. Yeah, it could go very, uh, very easily, it could go out of control. So what I am trying to say is that these uh, compositions of, of zigzags between two fixed objects could form a proper class. Of 
some of the compositions will get identified clearly, but a priori you, you cannot have any control. Do you have any control that it will always be a set? I always need to take, so this, these kinds of figures, these are called roofs, okay. This A, uh, A, B, C, that is called a roof, yeah, I mean, it looks like a roof. A pair of morphisms where one is invertible, uh, one is in S and another one is not. So this finite sequences of roofs, well, they can choose any intermediate objects <laughs> and that is a problem. Yeah, so therefore, compositions of zigzags, they can form a proper class. So immediately, like even if SC is locally small, S inverse C need not be. You understand? So the things can go out of control very easily. So we want to control it somehow. Okay, so this is one thing that I want to uh, emphasize on. And then there is another thing which also you should know about. So I am going to use a different color. If uh, C has, let us say, a terminal object, a zero object, let us say, we are talking about uh, abelian category. If C has a zero object and the unique morphism from 0 to A, this belongs to S. Then 0 morphism is always preserved by any functor, right. So, uh, so therefore, uh, 0 object is preserved by any functor, so nice enough functor. So, uh, this unique morphism became an isomorphism. So, what happened to A? A also becomes zero object, isomorphic to a zero object. So therefore, when you want to localize certain arrows, then you are also killing certain objects. So there are two different ways. Yeah, so uh, set of morphisms in algebra, yes, localization with respect to a set of morphisms. Non-zero multiplicative closed set, yeah, no, uh, containing no zero divisors either. Yeah, I mean, you generally ask for that. No, we don't reject anything. This is a we are talking about localization in categories, yeah, and in category theory we generalize everything possible. So we are also going to kill some objects. Yeah, so uh, and hence in localization. Thus, in localization, LA will be isomorphic to 0. So, we are killing some objects. So, the data, therefore, the data of localization can also be provided. <coughs> using objects which get killed. So there are two ways of providing the data for localization. Either you provide a set of morphisms which will be a subcategory, yeah, uh, which contains identity morphisms or equivalently you can like if your category has nice enough structure then you can also provide some uh, collection of objects, some class of objects that you want that you wish to kill, okay. So now uh, if you understood all these ideas, I am uh, ready to state how to do it for a particular class of morphisms. Is it okay? These both methods are actually equivalent. In the case of abelian categories, these are equivalent. Yeah, so it is not different. Let me start with the definition. So, 
this is Gabriel and Zisman. You have seen the name of Gabriel already. So, Gabriel and Zismal, this, this is left multiplicative system. Okay. So, what is a left multiplicative system? You start with a collection of, so uh, S, S is uh, a, col <coughs> sorry, a collection S of morphisms of morphisms of an abelian category. A is called an LMS left multiplicative system if first of all the identity belongs to us for each A in OBA. Second property it should be closed under composition. So, if F and G belong to S and uh, G composed with F is definable, G composed with F exists, then G composed with F is also in S. Third property, okay, uh, it says that given this diagram, given any such diagram, there exist, so given A, B, C, a roof with F in S and G is arbitrary morphism, there are H and uh, K, uh, there is there is, uh, there are H and K morphisms of A with K in S such that I can complete the diagram. So, A, F, G and then H, K. such that this diagram commutes. So, what exactly are we saying? Kg is equal to HF. Yeah, so, from something from the left hand side, like if you try to read it some different way that F inverse G, then that is same as HK inverse. Yeah. So, left and right we have to worry like usually when you study localization from commutative algebra, then you do not need to worry about these things. Everything is commuting. And the fourth property, yeah, this will also take care of 0 divisors etcetera like whatever you want. The fourth property is also interesting. So, given a parallel pair F and G uh, together with some morphism S with S such that F S is equal to G S. there exists some T from B to D. I mean this is a curly thing such that T F 
is equal to Tg. So, if this parallel pair can be equalized, weakly equalized on the left by, uh, by a morphism, by an invertible morphism or morphism in this multiplicative system, then something similar happens on the right as well. Everything is di about duality. Yeah? If left thing happens, then right happens. If you can, uh, if you are given a roof, then you have this sink kind of shape. And uh, dually you can define a right multiplicative system. The first two properties will remain as they are. The last one, like if you are given a sink, then you can complete, add a roof so that it, it is complete. The parallel morphisms have to be in S. And given a parallel pair, if it is weakly co-equalized by a morphism in S, then it is also weakly equalized by a morphism in S. Okay, so right and left, both systems and then left plus right, it's just multiplicative system. And that is the definition that you see in ring theory, uh, in commutative rings, commutative algebra. Okay, so why, why do we do this? Yeah, this left multiplicative system or this calculus of fractions as it is popularly called. Yeah, calculus of fractions, why do we need this? Well, first of all, people wanted to generalize these common ideas from commutative algebra to non-commutative algebra as well. And then algebra, once you realize that the ring is just single object pre-additive category, so you bring everything to morphisms. So, this particular calculus of fractions is quite useful in the following construction. So, now for such a, so given I mean, I am just going to talk about a multiplicative system. You can say anything, left or right or both. Given a multiplicative system, I mean, here I will talk about left, S on a category, on an abelian category A. Uh, define a new category S inverse A as follows. So, the first thing that we need to do is define its objects, describe its objects. So, objects of S inverse A are same as objects of we do not change the objects at all. Yeah, there is another way to do it like by shrinking the objects, but we are not going to do that here. Objects of A and morphisms now. So, morphisms from in S inverse A between A uh, like a and B are diagrams of this kind, the sinks, sorry this should be C, uh, okay, are equivalence classes of pairs of morphisms indicated on the side, on the right, okay. So, see what, uh, what we started with was a left multiplicative system and what we changed it to like we, uh, we gave some axiom for a roof but we actually took a sink, okay. Uh, so, this is, I said equivalence classes of pairs of morphisms indicated on the right. I have to describe the equivalence relation, yeah. So, subject to the equivalence relation, uh, 
I mean this you have to verify that it is indeed an equivalence relation. So see uh, I can write A and B then I can write C1 then this is any morphism and this is any morphism and this is C2 and this is also another sink. So these two sinks are said to be equivalent. This is F1, G1, F2, G2. If there exists this diagram between F1, G1 and F2, G2 defined by the existence of F3, G3 and uh, let us say H and K. So, I am going to use a different color because I can. So, this is another such sink with morphisms H and K defined like this so that all four triangles commute. Okay, so this looks like a lot, but what this is trying to do very simply is it will try to say that uh, 2 by 3 is 4 by 6. Yeah, that is what we are trying to do here. Nothing different is happening. Yeah, here please do not get confused like 2 by 3 and 4 by 6, they are all arrows. Yeah, so, you can have multiple representations for uh, for the same rational number. Yeah, so, this is that. <coughs> so, subject to this equivalence relation, well, we are also have to like we are defining a new category. So, what is the identity? So, identity of A is can you guess 1 sub a and 1 sub a yeah so a to a it should be a sink and both of them should be identities we do not change anything it is the equivalence class of this and what is composition so composition is Well, I will say A to B and then to E, this is C, then this is B, these are two wiggly morphisms. So, if you are given such two things, what can you do? You, you, you get a roof and you complete that roof by using that property to a sink. So, there will exist this blue diagram and then the equivalence class will be of these two uh, like A to F and then E to F. That equivalence class <coughs> is what your composition is. That is why we added this property and while checking that this is indeed an equivalence relation whatever we wrote above you will also use property 4 of left multiplicative system. Okay, so, there is lot of checking here, but in these lectures, I am just going to give you an idea of things. Any questions so far? One last thing remaining about this that we are given S and we constructed S inverse A, it is indeed a category. Can we describe the map like the functor from C to S inverse C? What will, uh, so this functor, the localization functor, so called lo uh, localization functor L. So, L from C to S inverse C is defined by A mapping to itself, B mapping to itself and this F mapping to what? A to B via S and B to B via 
very good and the equivalence class of this. Yes, we cannot just say a single pair of morphisms, but an equivalence class of <coughs> pair. Yeah, so that is the map. Now, whether it is embedding or not, I mean, whether it is fully uh, faithful or not, that will depend on S, your situation. In general, it is not. And then what will be like for, uh, for given functor F, what will be F tilde? We want this diagram, yeah, I mean C to D also, if, if that is given, wh how, what will happen with S inverse C? Once a bay. Yeah, I mean, see, you have to describe a map uh, like a functor f tilde. So it will take an object a to what? Object a to f a. Yeah, f a. So uh, and a morphism, where will it go? A morphism in S inverse C is the equivalence class of that. So it will go like the non-S part will remain as it is. You map it to FA to FB. And the, uh, the invertible part, like the some, some morphism in S from that sink, that will go to not identity. It will be mapped to the inverse of it of this morphism in the image. So given, yeah, for the universal property, given f from a, uh, a to b sending each morphism in S to an ISO define f tilde from S inverse A to B as follows. You send A to F A, yeah? you do not change anything because you had to land in B. Then you have this particular sink F and then you have something over here, let us say little s, which is in s. So this one will also be sent to fc, but then this middle morphism, the equivalence class of this, this morphism will be sent to the composition. You take fb as it is, this is ff, no problem over there, and this morphism will be the inverse of fs because it is defined yeah that was the property that fs is invertible so this is localization yes left side of what is a morphism Yes, morphism to morphism, yes. Left side is a morphism in S inverse C. It is the equivalence class of this. You pick any representative and then you do this. And then you have to show that actually it uh, like it does not depend on the choice of, of B. I mean A and C are fixed. B is different. You can have multiple things in the middle, right. So, uh, Therefore, you just have to make sure that it does not depend on the choice of representative and they, that is where this uh, diagram will come into play, the equivalence relation. Yeah, you have, there is a lot of verification here, but it is a routine verification. It is important that you understand the idea. F does not have an inverse, Fs has an inverse. Uh -huh. S is in capital S. Yes, that is a good question. What is the inverse of S in S inverse C? Maybe I should write it. <coughs> oh, 
Okay, so that's a really good question. So given f from a to b in S, yeah, so we want to see whether it is really invertible. How do you embed it? Like then the corresponding morphism in S inverse C will be? Yes, 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 correct. So uh, the, the image of f in S inverse A is this equivalence class. A, this is f and then 1b, this equivalence class, yeah. Its inverse is You tell me. Yes, so uh, the equivalence class we had to start at B, then I will take identity on B to B, and then I will make this F okay. So this is the multiplicative inverse. You can verify that it is two sided inverse right so this is uh, so it has universal property and each morphism in s actually got inverted right so this is one way of doing localization and this is economic <coughs> because of this left multiplicative system so calculus of fractions we could uh, accommodate lots, lots of things. We could avoid talking about sequences of sinks or sequences of roofs. Yeah, any such sequence can be uh, converted into only one sink. Yeah, so that is the important part here. If we have some extra data present in S, then lots of things become easy. Now, I already promised you that uh, there is another way of converting uh, like of killing objects and that is also a way to localize a category. So this is our second way of doing that. So a ser subcategory, by the way I mean I did not emphasize on this enough but we are talking about two of the greatest names in 20th century in this lecture. Grothendieck, Grothendieck is like the biggest name in 20th century and Ser, yeah, JP Ser. Yeah, so a Ser subcategory, uh, S, yeah, I mean here I am going to use this curly S of an abelian category. is a full subcategory whose objects satisfy the following property. So actually whenever we talk about ser subcategory uh, then we are only really interested in the collection of objects, the class of objects, because we uh, it is a full subcategory, so morphisms will automatically be there, whose objects satisfy the following property. Yeah? For any short exact sequence, zero to A to B to C to zero in A, B belongs to S if and only if both A and C <coughs> belong to S. Okay, so what like in uh, in words what it says is that whenever you are given an object in the ser subclass, then its subobjects are also there. A is a subobject of B and quotient objects are also there. So this uh, sub subclass is closed under subobjects and quotient objects. 
and simultaneously it's also closed under extensions so extension means that if given c and a b is the extension b is an extension of c by a so it is closed under sub objects quotient objects and extensions these three properties okay and it can be expressed very succinctly in uh, just one line that for any short exact sequence this happens okay now uh, define a class of morphisms corresponding to this to be all those morphisms f from a to b such that the kernel object which i am going to write like this kernel object and the co kernel object of f they belong to s okay so kernel object so here what i am using really is this that given any f a b i have a short exact sequence namely kernel f this is simply the inclusion this is zero and then there is a quotient onto the co kernel object and then zero <coughs> i'm using this slightly long exact sequence yeah slightly longer it's not exactly short it has five internal terms and this is like classic kernel f and this is co kernel f as the morphisms and these are objects so what i'm saying is that this particular sequence is going to turn uh, sorry this particular morphism f will be an isomorphism if its kernel and co kernel are both in s now see what happens when you take uh, the image under localization kernel f will become zero and co kernel f will become zero in isomorphic to zero in the in the localization so therefore in between we have exactness when do we have this exactness it is zero f and zero that is exact if and only if f is an is an isomorphism isomorphism yeah ap and mono because the category is balanced so this is an isomorphism so therefore f will become an isomorphism so i, I defined ms okay so now so therefore define the localization of a with respect to s written a mod s as uh, the localization function from a to ms inverse of a yeah if you want to kill certain objects then you might as well make these ms morphisms in ms as isomorphisms so this is the localization this is ser uh, localization any questions i can talk a lot about this but in this limited time i just want to give you an idea of what this is yeah but if you have any questions yes because many times we want to kill particular objects so as i said like it it doesn't matter whether you choose to make some objects isomorphic to zero in the localization or make some morphisms invertible so there is a way of also going back yeah given if if your category is abelian then given a class of morphisms you can also describe which objects objects you are going to kill so well yes kernels and co kernels of those morphisms and there will be some ramifications 
So there are lots of things here. Yeah, I mean, some keywords if you want to search is our uh, hereditary torsion theories, orthogonality classes. Yeah, then uh, I mean, ser subcategories, and obviously this just ordinary multiplicative systems. If you want to know more, you should Google these things. Hereditary torsion theories, orthogonality classes, injectivity classes, orthogonality classes, these are all rela related terms. Okay, why did I define this? Yeah, because I said look, uh, the class of Grothendieck categories is closed under localization. So, I want to give you, in, in fact, I want to give you one. A uh, very interesting result here, and it shouldn't be surprising that it was proven by Gabriel and <coughs> Popescu. This is a Romanian name, uh, Gabriel Popescu theorem. In this area, actually, there are many Romanian names, yeah, Diaconesu in category theory. Uh, so every country has some specific things. Yeah, this uh, Central Europe is more popular for abstraction. Yeah, Hungary is popular for combinatorics. Then Poland, Czech Republic, they are popular for set theory and logic categories. Yeah, similarly Romania. So Gabriel Popescu theorem. Gabriel was a student of Grothendieck. Yeah, his PhD thesis uh, had lot of interesting things. So Gabriel Popescu theorem, let me state that. So A is Grothendieck with generator G. So, I mean, sorry, I should say suppose. Suppose A is Grothendieck with generator G. Uh, let R be A G G. Do you understand what R is? It is a single object pre additive category. So, it is a ring. Okay, so, I can talk about modules over this ring. Okay, then A to the category of right modules, which I can write as this functor category, then over here I can take the home functor at the generator, then it will have a left adjoint L, uh, I mean A G blank is fully faithful, yeah. Uh, then A G blank, then there exists this diagram with L exact, okay. So what, what exactly am I saying here that there is a diagram? Uh, so let me try to unravel some of the things. So A G blank is fully faithful. Uh, do you remember if right adjoint is fully faithful, then what do we call the left adjoint? Reflection, yeah, reflector. L is the reflection, L is the reflector. And moreover, I said, so this is also called, ref reflection is also called a localization if yeah and uh, so a reflection l uh, i is called a localization if l preserves finite limits Okay, so once again coming back to the original idea that we have a left include, uh, we have a right adjoint, 
the left adjoint always preserves what? Co-limits. Yeah, co-limits are present. All co-limits are present on both sides. So, it preserves co-limits. So, in particular, it preserves finite byproducts. And as a consequence, it preserves finite products. So, you only need to, like when we say that L is exact, we only really mean that it L preserves kernels. We do not really ask for anything. Like this is extra. Yeah, normally it will preserve everything apart from kernels because it is a left adjoint. But here, what we are saying that every growth end category is a localization of a module category. I mean, left or right does not really matter, does it? R op or left modules over R are right modules over R op. So, left and right is not important, but every module, every growth end category is a localization in this sense, yeah, in this highlighted sense of a module category. Next time we will open with some properties of growth end categories and we will also prove fried Michel embedding theorem. It is a short proof, yes. Yes. So, this will also be a localization. Yeah, every such localization that is a really good point. Yeah, I mean I am not talking about two different things. The localization function with respect to a ser subcategory that will always give you this. Yeah, so uh, you, you, you should, I mean you will need to read a lot before you can understand with respect to what class of morphisms or what class of objects. But uh, a simple idea, I will tell you, uh, the category of all left exact functors from a small, uh, from a ring to this, yes, let us say A, a op, maybe I will write it. Uh, an example, so uh, if you remember Cartesian or Lex functors from a small abelian category, this is small abelian. So, Cartesian or Lex, yeah, uh, to ab, yeah, these are additive functors and on the other side we have got the full functor category R of ab, yeah, then obviously the Lex functors embed inside this and you also have a right adjoint. This is basically Gabriel Ulmer duality, but the enriched version over ab. Yeah, I am not saying anything different. This is I and this is L. So, what is, um, so normally we will have this kind of map, right? A, A1 cross A2 uh, blank. And then we will have A, A1 blank cross A, A2 blank. So, these are functors, these are home functors, so they are objects on the right hand side and there is some morphism between them and we need that in Lex functors this morphism becomes an isomorphism. So, you have to take the orthogonality like classes, uh, class with respect to such, such things. You want this morphism to become an isomorphism, right? in Lex. So, therefore, you have to take this uh, these classes of morphisms like of this kind. Then you also encode and this is a small set obviously, yeah, because A is small abelian and that is how you construct this kind of localization. Okay, we will use it next time. Let us stop.